I'm going around. Is it the middle of the month? Too? Oh, okay. I'd like to ask everyone to join us in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, sure. Talk to Tutwiler. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, this evening, um, to kick off our time together, we've got a presentation of certificates. I really think of this as being a night of excellence um, as we celebrate uh, the academic and leadership uh, talents of a group of students and our, uh, the esteemed uh, Lynn English Marine Corps uh, JROTC. Uh, I'm going to start with the Massachusetts Association for School Superintendents uh, Academic Ele Excellence Award, which is presented by the superintendent, yours truly, to a deserving student in each high school. To be considered for the award, the student must be a member of the senior class with a cumulative GPA that places them in the top fifth percentile of their class. Uh, the nominee must also consistently demonstrate traits of leadership, social responsibility, respect for their fellow students, and involvement in various aspects of the school community. Uh, there's six students that we're going to celebrate this evening, and I've read up on each one of them, and let me tell you, they, they far exceed that description. So I'm happy to begin. I'll come around, and Meryl, join me. I'll do the best I can to bend down here and speak. Into so the first, we're going to go in alphabetical order by school and by student. Uh, we're going to start with Jason Garcia from Lynn Classical. Jason will come on over. And now if you get to stand here, we're going to talk about you for a little bit. Okay? <laughs> uh, 
Yes. Now, Jason is uh, number one in his class at Classical High School with a GPA of 4.6. It didn't even go that high when I was in high yeah. school. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what they told me. Uh, in addition to being involved in a number of clubs and activities at Classical, including captain of the math team, co-captain of the college, uh, college bowl quiz team, uh, he's a LaVita scholar, mm. also volunteers at Phillips Manor Nursing Home. Uh, and at present has applied to some very selective schools such as uh, MIT, Stanford, and Northeastern. I did not see Holy Cross <laughs> on that list, but I'm proud of you nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> We like for you to be in the picture, yes. actually. He's going to take this one first. All right, come on. We'll do that. We'll... Come on, Mom. Come on. Come on. Next, can I bring up uh, Amen LaRussi? How you doing? I'm great. How about you? Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. So Amen is number two at uh, Classical High School with a GPA of 4.6, also oh. not that high uh, when I was uh, doing the thing. Um, many uh, honors and awards at school, including the Harvard Book Award, Outstanding Biology Award, um, tennis. I'm a tennis guy, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'd like to become. Oh, you, oh you'll teach me how to play? Also volunteers at Phillips Manor Nursing Home uh, and tutors uh, other students in uh, math and science. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you work at the Linway Mart. Yeah. Okay. I and run the cleaning crew. You so if run. You're wondering why it's so clean? It's because of me. It's because of me. You're going places, man. Uh, and has applied to, also applied to a list of really selective schools, uh, Princeton University, which will make uh, member Nicholson, who's a Princeton grad over there, very happy. Go Tigers. Uh, but also Harvard and Dartmouth, um, as well as, read that, read that. College of the Holy Cross. <laughs> <laughs> He's not Join biased brother, at all. Okay. Join your brother. That, that would be wise. That would be wise. Okay. What would that is? Yeah. Okay. Come right over. Yes. Moving on to Lynn English, uh, is Talia Dudley with us? Come on over, Talia. Congratulations. Uh, so Talia uh, is ranked number two uh, at Lynn English with a GPA of 4.58. I'd round that up to 4.6. Um, number two. The school committee might remember your name because I read about you uh, when we heard some really wonderful news about you being the Quest Bridge right. National Scholar, winning that scholarship, mm -hmm. attending Tufts University free of charge for four years. Oh, that you? Nice. Woo. Woo. 
whole host of wonderful activities she's engaged uh, in at Lynn English, including captain of the quiz team, also tennis, something going on with tennis these days, <laughs> math team, and volunteers at Phillips Manor also. You've been doing so since seventh grade. Really proud of you. Congratulations. That's new. No, it's on someone here. Would just be on Tracy. Okay, come on over. I just I was just over there like two weeks ago. Congratulations. Uh, can I call Adnan Jalal? Oh, he's been Adnan. Adnan is number one in his graduating class at Lynn English uh, with a 4.59 GPA. Um, the many awards, Harvard Book Award, Lynn City All-Star for Indoor Track. Now the key question is, do you think you can beat me in a race? <laughs> <laughs> the easy answer is yes. <laughs> humble. Oh, he's, humble. Yeah. he's humble. He's humble. He's a nice guy. Uh, volunteers frequently at my brother's table and uh, applied to a number of uh, wonderful schools, Harvard, Brown, and UC Berkeley, all the way on the other side. Do we know yet where we're going? No, not yet. Okay, we're waiting to hear. Yeah. We're, we're pulling for you. Yeah, thank and you. I know you're going to be successful. Thank you. All right, congratulations. Somebody here with you? Yeah, my parents. Please, come on over. Congratulations. He just walked in. Moving on to Lynn Tech, Destiny Davis, who I saw when I came in. Destiny is ranked second in her class at Lynn Tech with a GPA of 4.2. She's in the National Honor Society. Got the John uh, and Abigail Adams Scholarship, which is excellent. You do community service at my brother's table. Uh, and was involved in the Lynn Woods cleanup. Also applied to a bunch of wonderful schools, BU, Tufts, UMass, Lowell. Have we made a decision yet or are we still waiting? Still waiting, okay. UMass Lowell is a great school. Is it? Yes. <laughs> That's your alma mater? That's my alma mater. Okay, so, so UMass Lowell, all right? Congratulations. Can we bring up your family? Now, uh, Guadalupe Perez. Congratulations. Ranked number one, class of 2020, Lynn Tech. Let's go. With a GPA of 4.3, uh, recipient of the Harvard Book Award, the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. You're engaged in NHS, National Honor Society peer mentoring, mm -hmm. and the Lynn Community Health Summer Internship. How was that? Good. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, and you do community service at my, my brother's table, in addition to a number of other um, community service um, uh, opportunities in the city. And, uh, and you work at the Abbott House as a certified nursing assistant right now. Wow. wow. Okay. Just so my, I take it you're in health tech and you're going to go on for a nursing degree somewhere? Uh, either at uh, Northeastern, or UMass Boston, or UMass Amherst, or UMass Lowell. Good. <laughs> One of those places. Uh, I'll, don't, 
don't say hopefully. You're going to get in. <laughs> <laughs> we congratulate you. Yes. It's wonderful. Says you're a little shy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's a proud moment. Come right in. Sorry. It's okay. We'll get in. Congratulations. Thank you. Notice it, right? I don't want to talk I actually saved them, too. Uh, they like to get this money. Okay. Now on to uh, the Lynn English. Green Corps, JROTC drill team. Uh, I told Sergeant Major uh, when I greeted him just a moment ago that my new salutation to him is going to be congratulations, Sergeant Major. <laughs> That's your name. Because they just keep on winning and, and just displaying excellence in every way. The recent um, competition in Pennsylvania, uh, late January, first place unarmed personnel inspection, first place unarmed regulation, First place armed regulation, first place unarmed exhibition, first place unarmed dual exhibition, second place color guard, third place armed exhibition, third place armed dual exhibition, and third place new cadet squad. They must hate it when they see you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, late English is here again. Come on up. Let the superintendent hold that trophy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> another one. Substantial. This, 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 whoa. Would one of you like to talk about uh, the, the climate change? Why don't we let the senior talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> like this? Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we went to Pennsylvania. Um, it's a great time, as, as always. Uh, you know, we get yelled at, but it's, it's all in good fun. <laughs> Um, it's all with the purpose, you know, military, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us go. about the experience of it, uh, oh, traveling um, out there. And so they, they expect a lot out of us, but uh, we, we get it done. We're, we're around everywhere in the city. You guys see us, you know, we're a really big part of the community. Uh, we do a lot of things. So, you know, we, we lead by example. Mm. Because he's got his application into the Naval Academy. Oh, he does. Oh, yeah. Fingers crossed for you. I, I, I am super optimistic. And uh, I will echo uh, Devin. Yes. Uh, what Devin said, this group is everywhere in this city, volunteering, supporting the efforts. It's, you, you really you make us proud. Yeah. So congratulations yeah. for sure. It's our pleasure to present you the yes. certificate signed by myself and the mayor just to recognize your excellence and hard work continues. You too can hold the certificate. There you go. competition is in Beverly and that if you are successful there you'll go on to Florida. Okay. So you all already have your bags packed for Florida. I think we should have another round of applause for these amazing students.
I know you make your families proud and you make all of us proud as well. So congratulations. Keep up the great work. I don't know if anyone is here for the open mic. Uh, if you are, please sign in. And as you're signing in, I will read the uh, open mic policy. The open mic session is designed to provide an opportunity for citizens to express their views on matters of concern to the school committee. The sessions are not designed to encourage debate or lengthy exchange of views, but to have the committee understand numerous points of views. The committee would appreciate speakers to keeping their presentation. You just stand behind me.
I'm going to ask again that people stand and we salute the flag as we get into the regular meeting. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And I'd ask that everyone remain standing for a moment of silence in memory of Marlene Basil Matocchio, uh, paraprofessional to Harrington, who passed away on February 3rd. Uh, Frank A. Pagnotta, retired music director on January 27th. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Tutwiler. <coughs> yes, I just want to take this time to introduce uh, our new uh, student representative, Juliana Perry, who is a senior. Uh, at Lynn English, um, had a moment, a quick exchange with her, a very confident senior. She immediately told me that she would beat me in a game of basketball. <laughs> uh, the key is to just wear me down, because I don't have any. But welcome aboard. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, first on the agenda is the minutes. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting for the policy subcommittee meeting on January 23rd, 2020. Second. Second. The second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The uh, minutes are accepted. I'd also like to accept the minutes of the meeting for the buildings and grounds subcommittee meeting on January 30th, 2020. Second. second. I hear seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The uh, minutes are accepted. I'd like to accept the. Uh, Make a motion to accept the minutes of the personnel subcommittee meeting on January 30th, 2020. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The minutes are accepted. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the second regular meeting on January 30th, 2020. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The minutes are accepted. Uh, next on the agenda is presentations um, with Ms. Troy. Yes, Dr. Tawila. Uh, just, just by, you don't need the reminder, but uh, one of the district improvement goals last year was to uh, identify and adopt a social emotional learning curriculum for elementary K to five. Um, successful in doing so, and this is an implementation year, which is a major undertaking, as you might imagine. But um, thought it prudent at this point to kind of give you an update on some of the activities involved in that implementation. And Carolyn Troy, who's the Executive Director of Social Emotional Learning, um, is here to do that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm excited to give you an update not only on the implementation of our Caring Schools curriculum, but also on a new SEL program called Student Ambassadors. I believe that you all have. So I'm very excited to talk with you this evening about our Student Ambassador Program and to provide you with an update on the implementation of our K-5 Caring School Community Curriculum. The Lynn Public Schools strive to support a culture that reflects belonging and creates experiences that build the capacity of our students as leaders. We envision building this culture through the intentional integration of the tenets of social-emotional learning into the fabric of our schools. The district believes social emotional learning and support is an integral part of ensuring positive school experiences and we want students to have opportunities to develop and apply these SEL core competencies. By weaving social emotional learning into relevant learning experiences, these competencies will be reinforced through hands-on application of skills. The Student Ambassador Program is an example of a structure and practice that reflects the district's overarching vision of social emotional learning and embodies the core values of the district. The Student Ambassador Program strives to maintain a membership of engaged, inspired learners who will best represent the Lynn Public Schools within the school and the larger community. The Student Ambassador Program intentionally provides a structure that gives students opportunities to acquire and apply SEL competencies, including developing and showcasing leadership skills, working collaboratively, <coughs> appreciating diversity, self-motivation, and perspective taking. Many times, a student ambassador could be a student's first contact with the Lynn Public Schools, and therefore, an ambassador should be a welcoming and enthusiastic representative of the Lynn Public Schools. 
This initial contact and additional layer of support could ease the already challenging entry and transition for students new to the Lynn Public Schools. To support the school community, student ambassadors would also volunteer at school events such as fine arts performances, school-wide events, teacher conferences, etc. Ambassadors would welcome and help families navigate their way around the school. And they also may have a table in the cafeteria where new students or a student who needs a spot to sit can go and feel comfortable and welcomed by the ambassadors at the table. These are just a few examples um, of what a role could be of a student ambassador. The goal is to develop a framework for the program that provides opportunities to apply SEL skills that they are learning throughout, through their participation in this program and through their interactions with peers, faculty, families, and the school community. The proposed framework to support the Student Ambassador Program includes two faculty advisors to monitor and support the launch of the program. We are in the process of forming a committee that will meet in the spring of 2020 to develop the actual framework for the Student Ambassadors Program, and the goal is to launch this program in our high schools district-wide during school year 2021. Lynn Classical High School has initiated a soft launch of this program as part of their turnaround plan, and this effort was highlighted in the Turnaround Times newsletter titled Students Lead the Way. Lynn Classical adopted a student ambassador program as a way to support our English language learners. Specifically, this was a way to support a growing number of English learners arriving in the district with limited education. With one of Lynn Classical High School's many strengths, a supportive multicultural learning community filled with students who are fluent in more than in two or more languages. At the beginning of the year, a handful of students were placed from study halls into classes by preference and availability after an early recruitment effort in the spring by the administrative team and other stakeholders. And by the end of December, the roles have grown to 28 ambassadors, uh, to 15 different teachers with a wait list of both teachers and ambassadors awaiting matches. Lynn Classical High School sent a survey to both student ambassadors and teachers, and encouraging trends included things such as all students said their primary role in the classroom is translating words and concepts, um, and 90% of students said their experience could be improved uh, could be sorry could be improved by being provided with opportunities to lead more activities and doing more than just translating. Of the 10 teachers who currently have ambassadors that responded, 100% said they feel having an ambassador has helped them improve their instruction for English learners. Teacher feedback stated, the ambassador in my class, the ambassadors in my class are so helpful, it would be a completely different class without them. I look forward to working with them every day. They translate, help give directions, uh, pass out papers, explain things to students, and make sure students are on task. I couldn't function the way I do in class without their help. Out of the 17 students who responded, 100% said they felt useful in the classroom and rated their experience as either positive or very positive. As a district, we're excited about the impact this program will have for our students, and it will support and strengthen the climate and culture of our schools, provide an added layer of support for our students, and provide opportunities for our students to acquire and apply SEL skills. This will also support the foundation of our Tier 1 support. I'd also just like to provide a brief update on the Caring School Community curriculum implementation. Uh, with the support of a professional learning, um, a professional learning plan co-developed with our Caring School Community Learning Consultant, the Lynn Public Schools began its rollout of the curriculum beginning in the fall of 2019. As a part of the implementation plan, each K-5 school has identified an SEL leadership team that includes a variety of roles, such as a building administrator, support staff representative, and teacher. Leadership teams play a key role in communicating shared decisions about the program with staff. SEL leadership teams participate in in-person and virtual learning sessions and are the Caring School Community Liaison for their school. SEL leadership teams launch, lead, and monitor a strong implementation of caring schools within their own buildings. The professional learning plan has included four in-person sessions and five virtual support sessions, providing our faculty with monthly touch points with our Caring School Community Learning Consultant. In these professional learning sessions, teams are provided with information, including but not limited to a general overview and introduction to the curriculum, 
an introduction to and unpacking of the roles of the principal and the SEL leadership team, preparing for and the initial launch of the Caring School curriculum, and monitoring and support of the implementation. In order to best support the professional learning needs of our faculty and to ensure a strong and sustained implementation, the district worked closely with our learning consultant to determine the scope and sequence of the implementation. Along with ongoing professional learning on the resource itself, the district has committed to implementation of the Caring School Community Morning Circle. Full, implement, full implementation of the curriculum will begin in September 2020. This will include morning circle, closing circle, cross-age buddies, and home side activities, as well as classroom lessons. The plan for school year 2021 includes another full year of professional learning with the Caring School Consultant and ongoing monitoring and support for schools. This learning will be twofold. One, to orient new faculty to the resource and to deepen the learning for existing SEL leadership teams. We are also excited to be in conversation with our out-of-school providers about caring school community and how the Lynn Public Schools may, may be able to partner with the community to align our vision and practices and to ensure we have a common understanding and common language around social emotional learning. Some questions, thank you for the presentation. Thank member you. Nicholson and then Member Gately. <clears throat> uh, Thank you so much for the for the presentation and for the exciting update. This is terrific. This is great news. Uh, thank you to your team that's worked on this and all the teachers <coughs> that are working on the, the projects and the, the student ambassadors. What an amazing project! Yes. I think that's really cool. Thank I, you, you know, I, I think we 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 we've always known that there there are some students that, are, that can be leaders in their in their classrooms, and I think it's so cool that we're able to formalize that here, particularly as obviously we're a big district, the numbers are big, and the needs are big, and having that structure I think is is really crucial. Thank you. Um, and I think it's great that you're getting feedback from the students and teachers on that. I think that's, and, I, and, and that you're sharing that with us. I think that's really helpful for us to think about how that's rolling out. I'm sure you're thinking about ways to address that yes. kind of feedback. Um, so that that's awesome. Um, what, one thing that occurred to me, uh, I, I, w do you have a sense of the, the grades the students are in for the ambassadors, like w what grades they're in? At classical right now, I'm not sure, and we need to think about that when we're thinking about the framework. Um, it, depending on the model and depending on the role, you want students to have um, one of the philosophies is that you would wait until they were maybe entering in as sophomores mm -hmm. and then continuing on, and then when they go into their junior and senior year, they would become the mentors for the sophomores coming in, mm -hmm. and that freshmen sometimes are the group, the target group that we want to support, uh, but I'd like to see the feedback of the committee as well that's yeah. being formed. But that's that's originally the thought. To that provide a lot, a lot of, of support for incoming freshmen. All right. And I, w I wonder if there's an opportunity at some point to connect some of those students. We've been talking a lot about building a pipeline for, for mm -hmm. our students to become educators. Mm -hmm. And obviously these, these students are starting to think mm -hmm. along those, those lines. Yeah. Um, so potentially an opportunity sure. there. Um, and then for the the caring school community mm -hmm. curriculum implementation also a great update um, one of the so what, one of the things I think we had thought about in the when we had this conversation around this time last year was how you guys were going to like set the baseline of what we're, we're doing now so you can determine the effectiveness of, of the, the changes that you're making mm -hmm. um, so wanted to get your thoughts on how on how that was going in terms of the, the baseline setting that you're gonna that you can use for comparison sure purposes. sure right now we're spending a lot of time providing the information on the resource but there's also um, a survey that we're going to be administering to faculty around the climate and culture and we're going to administer that within the next couple of weeks and then that will be a survey that will be administered each year and there's surveys for faculty there's surveys for students um, and there's also tools around implement around monitoring the implementation and what evidence we're looking for in classrooms for example or what a principal would look for if they were observing a morning circle or a closing circle so there's ways that we can see how it's rolling out for its effectiveness but there are surveys that we're going to be doing on a regular basis to track that thank you so much thank you. Member Gately. Um, thank you for your presentation. But um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, like, we're, we're doing really good with the elementary, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then the ambassadors is a phenomenal idea. I love that. But what about those middle schools? 
Well, the, we're in the process of doing our 612 SEL framework committee work as we speak. This it started a couple of weeks ago, and we have a couple of weeks to go, and that's part of what we're thinking about is what should a comprehensive framework look like for our 612 students that is rooted in district core values and in equity. Yes, and it should trickle in from the elementary going into middle yes. school. Yes. Then it'll be perfect. Yes, we're looking for that vertical alignment of skills. Thank yes. you very much. Of course. For for Member Satterwhite. Um, thank you. I just have a question uh, about the ambassador program. I think it's a wonderful <coughs> program. I think it's it's such a, a good tool. <clears throat> My uh, fear is that um, when we start uh, moving forward with the high school design, mm -hmm. uh, these students that may have been in study hall would want to possibly take a college course or mm -hmm. do something different with their time than mm -hmm. than do the um, uh, classroom experience. Um, is this something that you can work with, with Shannon to make sure that this is in the in the spectrum and maybe reach out to the colleges to see if there's some sort of co-op credit that they can get with with regards to the classroom experience they're getting yes the the framework that's happening at classical right now around having students come out of study hall isn't necessarily the exact framework that the student ambassadors will have um, but it is something to think about we need to know if students are going to opt to come out of study hall any other implications that may have and there have also been conversations about depending on the framework and depending on the the types of things that students are providing is there anything that we can do to provide something for them in terms of their transcripts for colleges and it, it you know these are the students that um are able to do the work with regards to the instructions and all that stuff so you know these kids uh, are bright and and they're able to help uh mm -hmm. you know other students which is great mm -hmm. um so when they're get, you know given a, a possible uh, alternative to to spend their time they might i'm just saying mm -hmm. go 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 a different route to save some money on, maybe on college credits or whatnot sure. So that's sense. that's I just want that to be in the, in the purview of, okay. of what you're doing because sure. it's a great program, okay. and and it's it's uh, I think that that should be at least uh, looked into. Absolutely, thank you for the feedback. <clears throat> no problem. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Member. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, wonderful presentation, and just to echo my colleagues, this program is is great. Um, I actually really got to work with uh, some of the folks over from Classical mm -hmm. uh, to see what that soft mm -hmm. um, approach, mm -hmm. you know, how the results mm -hmm. um, came to fruition. Yeah. Um, it's something that I feel should be at the middle school level. I think that's a good, mm -hmm. um, I think Member Gailey kind of sure. pointed to eighth mm -hmm. grade being a big transition year. Yeah. I think yeah. some of the folks in the middle schools would really appreciate this program mm -hmm. as well. Um, what, if, if we could say, so, so in terms of just the student ambassador, like mm -hmm. what ways are we going to train them? Who's going to be training them? How we, are, how do you, so if I'm a student, I want to be a student ambassador. Mm -hmm. Walk me through it. Sure. Well, it will depend on what we decide in terms of the committee for what the framework would be, but it could be something such as, I mean, we would advertise about student ambassadors, what they do, the role that they would have. In the beginning, for a brand new program, you may select students that you think would be sort of natural leaders to go into that position, but it could be an opportunity where students would have an application process, where it's just about teaching them about thinking about why it's important for them to be an ambassador, maybe being able to verbalize what they think they could contribute to other students, to the climate and culture, um, maybe their strengths or areas of challenge that they're working on or skills that they would like to develop so that students are already starting to think about their decision making around do I want to be a part of this it's a commitment so there has to be some opportunity for students to say I will commit to this <coughs> if so if we did an application process that would sort of walk them through to the point where they would be sort of an interview with whoever the advisors are as we're developing the framework I'll be working very closely with the committee and also the advisors around what this would look like and then there would be an onboarding of student ambassadors in the summer sort of a half day is how I envision it um, around talking them through what the expectations are what the roles are who to talk to if maybe one of the students that they're working with mentions something that's concerning 
or if there's something that they feel like the student ambassadors need or could do differently to contribute back to the community, the school community or the larger community. So I think it would be a process from deciding if we're going to have an application process and designing that, and then there would be a summer orientation, and then they would commit to so many events or activities to volunteer at throughout the course of the school year. And it, we would really have to break down for them what the responsibility is, because both for advisors and student ambassadors, it's definitely a commitment, but a wonderful opportunity to build leadership. Yeah, so I, that, actually, the activity piece. So I know we had the in-class activities. I know the, uh, the survey data, I love that. I love the student perspective is so important, and the fact that you guys went out the way to, to encourage that uh, collection of surveys is awesome. Uh, what types of activities or options were you thinking to, to bring this to light? Like how, what, what activities, as you can see, students – Obviously, they're in the classroom and they're working with faculty, but what other activities do you feel would be uh, crucial to have? As a committee member, I would like to support sure. students to see what, you know, what are they saying they would like to see as acti activities. Well, I think it would be important to, to talk with students about what they would think would have been most helpful if they were entering into the school to get feedback around what would have made their transition easier, it would have made their entry easier. That's, although Classical is doing a lot of work in the classrooms, really when we think about student ambassadors, one of the most important things that I see for student ambassadors is an opportunity to provide a safe, welcoming environment for all students coming in, <coughs> especially students that may be entering in that don't know anybody, that are new to the country or new to the city and really feel um, incredible challenge or obstacles in entering into the school system. And so if we have a student ambassador, if a new student is starting and we're able to access a student ambassador who would come and introduce the student, walk them around, have a place to sit with them in the cafeteria, could show them the logistics of the building, could introduce them to people, talk to them about the activities in the school or the community. I see that as such a huge piece, and other things may build around that depending on the needs of the school, but I feel like f for me when I envision student ambassadors, one of the most important pieces around trying to build welcoming, safe environments. That's where we have to start the relationship. Sounds like the student ambassador social worker. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, that's I'm what it sounds like. You know, it sounds like uh, <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Member Ford. Thank you. Um, is there a... Um, a framework or, or a guide, set of guidelines or, for lack of a better term, job description for what you're looking for? That's what we would be developing, but yes, um, there are. this is a program that I had the privilege to be a part of in another district as well, so I have a general idea of the framework that was used there, but it could be very different here, and I really want to take the input from the faculty here as well as the students there on what would make the most sense for Lynn, but yes, there would ultimately be sort of a, a job description, I guess, um, of what what the role of a student ambassador would be. It would be clearly spelled out. Students would know exactly what they were um, committing to if they decided to be an ambassador. Thank yes, you. thank you. Great, thank you for your presentation. Okay, it was excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is um, under unfinished business, supervisor of attendance posting. Or I, I can start off if you'd like. Member Sadaway. <clears throat> um, uh, we at our last meeting uh, we voted to um, approve uh, the second position uh, uh, pending the um, final approval of the job posting to be posted once we vote on it. Um, at the last meeting uh, we got input from pretty much everybody. Um, one of the things that Kim said was that this was a very different role than what we filled um, in 2017 and <clears throat> uh, explained that social emotional learning, um, counseling was more of the, uh, the aspect of this position and not uh, a law enforcement type uh, mentality or approach to, to how we handle the attendance issues. Uh, based off of that, I did research throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country um, in this uh, specific uh, position um, is used, I would say, more so it's go going towards the, the role that we're trying to create. Right. So instead of trying to recreate the wheel, um, I was able to um, uh, put together uh, what I thought was some of the best practices uh, uh, that were posted in, in job postings to uh, be able to um, uh, fill a, a particular uh, position. 
Um, uh, Lorraine had made some um, uh, comments of what things she wanted to be changed. One of them was she would rather it be for a master's degree. I've spoke with her since that I don't want to eliminate as many, you know, because that, sure. that would, would, sure. would whittle the pool down. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I had talked about the social emotional learning, how it needs to be an, a, an aspect to this, and that's why you see um, uh, in the qualifications, the, the many reds in the qualifications. Uh, I said that I didn't uh, understand why I said possession of one of the followings. It should be a preferred experience or licensure, um, and that's why I changed that uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> Paragraph one underneath that uh, old p possession of one of the following or preferred experience and licensure. Lorraine didn't like the parole probation. She just wanted to say uh, that uh, the supervisor working with juveniles or, or, or whatnot, so that was uh, limited to that specific things. And then I had wanted uh, there to be information about someone understanding and being able to track specific data, and that's why that's in there. So. Um, I, I did as best as I, I could um, with what I, uh, information I got. Um, I don't know if you reviewed it. I also took on the assignment and okay. wrote a job description for you. Oh, perfect. Okay, so, good. So, Dr. Tutwiler, then we'll go to Member Gately because I think you were ready to speak before Member Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's quick, and I have that here. Uh, and, you know, we, we got this, and... We were under the impression that we were uh, going to bring something to present to you all, uh, but I, as I'm as I'm looking at them, I mean, there's there's this is a little more local than um, than the than the other one, but there's there's a lot of sameness in terms of like the conceptual pieces of the work, and I, and I just want to remind the committee also that you know, in as much as we might uh, take our time and detail the specifics around qualifications, responsibilities, and so forth. There is a next step which requires us to go and sit with the union, and ultimately they've got to put their seal of approval on there. So I just want to be, want you to be mindful that it may not look like what we, you know, where the discussion leads it to, you know, leads us relative to the to the posting tonight. It may look different. And that happened last year also with the um, with a number of the the positions that we talked about in the postings that we talked about. Ultimately, unions got to sign off. So I, I can share this with you. You can pass it around. You want to? Yeah. Um, and then can we, do you want to walk them through the document? Sure. Why don't we do that, if that's okay, Member Gately, or you want to speak prior to that? I if you want to, you can speak. I actually am a little confused because I don't have my copy that I edited before I came. I, Michael forgot to um, send it to me, so I had this old copy, so I really don't have this paper in front of me that I actually edited. So I just think it's, it's a little overwhelming here for qualifications. So I'm going to look at yours, and then I'll oh, right. chime in. Thank you. Okay. We have it. Yeah, we have enough. Yes, you want, and I think as it's being passed out, does everyone have it? Yeah. All right. And we'll, get a, yeah. we'll, and we'll run through it. Okay. So I think in terms of what I did here is really a focus in on what this job has become and not what it was. Um, in terms of the qualifications, um, we wrote a bachelor's degree or higher from an accredited college or university. And as you had wanted, preferred study in human services, social work, counseling, and or mental health fields. Knowledge and experience with the laws concerning school attendance connected to DESE mandates and child requiring assistance, which is your CRA statutes, um, connected to Massachusetts general law. A combination of experiences connected to working with school-aged children that focused that have focused on meeting social emotional learning needs. This position currently reports to the deputy superintendent. The recommendation is for this position to report to the executive director of social emotional learning. Performance responsibilities. What I did in this is I do an intro that is in a way very general because we need to be mindful of the fact that in some ways this position is an evolving position. We are developing this. 
You know, we talk about developing SEL frameworks. And the shift here in this position is into that framework versus a criminal justice kind of uh, mindset. The development of systems within every school to create anti-truancy environments that recognize good and improved attendance. So then I detail kind of what that means. Lead wellness teams in all assigned schools and act as a facilitator in these meetings. Support attendance data collection and dissemination for school-based teams. Oversee tracking systems connected to the attendance initiative, every student, every day. Support outreach and referrals for students and families. Support schools in the creation of internal protocols that improve the culture and climate. Support school programming for at-risk students, i.e. LEAP, Breed All-Stars, and Project Yes. Provide professional development to multiple stakeholders focused on matters related to attendance. Next, I move into the next general category. The supervisor of attendance will collaborate with multiple stakeholders, including, but not limited to, faculty, administrators, students, parents, community service providers, court personnel, in order to develop interventions that support a student's well-being and academic and social success. What does this mean? It means that they're gonna communicate and collaborate with the court primarily in matters related to CRAs, collaborate with community agencies for purposes of referral, and work in partnership with the community at large in creating a public awareness on the importance of student attendance. There needs to be that public campaign. The supervisor of attendance will provide supervision and evaluation to the assistant attendance officers supporting their ability to manage attendance issues and concerns, including but not limited to making home visits connected to attendance, participation in wellness teams as needed, investigate the whereabouts of no-show students, support of systems to verify student addresses, support school programming for at-risk students, which um, the assistant supervisors of attendance do all summer. They immerse themselves in those at-risk programs. The supervisor of attendance will manage and oversee the maintenance of all student records, the coordination of tutoring for all students out of school due to discipline issues, Corey, Sori, and SAFIS approvals for all school department employees, volunteers, and transportation employees, and oversee the attendance department budget. And then as we do on all, almost all of our postings, perform other duties as deemed necessary by the superintendent of schools. Dr. Tawila. Yeah, so as um, Mrs. Powers was reading through, um, I was just kind of doing a crosswalk with uh, the one that we provided. Um, and I mean, there's slightly different language and it's condensed, but, it, but it's essentially the same thing. I agree. Member Gailey? Um, I'm just like stuck on the fact that it's going from reporting to uh, Deputy Superintendent of Schools. Say it again, Lorena. Report. Oh, you can't hear me? I just can't hear you. Oh, reporting to the Deputy Superintendent of School, uh, reporting to the Executive Director of Social Emotional Learning. I'm wondering if Kristen does that now or the. Well, that's really where. You know, in terms of meeting with Carolyn, yes, she does. She does meet yeah. with Carolyn. Yeah. That's who she reports to? Technically, by contract, she reports to me. By what's written in the administrator's contract. Dr. Tutwiler. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this is part of the evolution of, of, Creating of, the, that of the job. So <laughs> the, the entire attendance initiative sits in the social-emotional learning realm. Uh, and so the attendance supervisors play a significant role in working with the wellness teams in each of the schools, as does the executive director of social-emotional learning. It, it, it doesn't make much sense for the supervisor of attendance to go around the person that's leading the attendance initiative and report to the deputy superintendent. So we, we just felt like this was a cleaning up the organization. 
That also, by the way, because it's new, would need a stamp of approval uh, by the administrators union. Is that away? And um, the, the good thing about having the, the past practice of, of this position being reported to the deputies or to the superintendent was if we were in a meeting, we could ask for input as to. I still supervise. I supervise um, Mrs. Troy. Okay. Troy. So. So you would still have the information? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then last, um, would this new supervisor of attendance not have the ability to be the supervisor of attendance for LEAP because it's not in here? So what I did on here was to support those at-risk programs. Um, I did not write into it that it's a guarantee for them to hold that position. Okay. Current um, supervisor of attendance has no interest. I don't know that it should be targeted for a specific employee, Okay. to be honest with you. Okay. Member Coppola. <coughs> now, is the other um, superintendent, I mean, um, supervisor of attendance, is she going under the old job description? This is what. Okay. Because oh, she? she's she's been hired under the old one. So what's what's going to happen? Is she's going to fall what, under this? This is what um, Mrs. Freyer does now. This is what Kristen does now. And in terms of reviewing this, Kristen and I reviewed it together. Okay. Uh -huh. She was part of the input. So Full Kristen support. was part of it. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. we had, had asked that last time if if she was going to be included. So I'm glad that she was included. Um, the only other thing I'm thinking is if it's reports to executive director of social emotional learning, is are we putting stuff on that eventually you're going to come and say, well, she's on the same level as a deputy superintendent, and then we're looking at more money for that job? No. I'm Dr. Tutwell? No, that, that's not the thinking at all. The thinking is really around what what makes sense in terms of the organization and the workflow. The executive director of social emotional learning, again, oversees the attendance initiative, reports to um, the deputy superintendent, and then the attendance supervisor, uh, it, it doesn't make sense for the attendance supervisor to report to the deputy superintendent when the executive director of social emotional learning is leading the attendance initiative. Okay. And also, if we think about curriculum, um, <clears throat> we have an executive director of curriculum. All of the assistant directors fall under Ms. Ms. O'Malley, and Ms. O'Malley repro reports to a deputy. Mm -hmm. So it would follow the same line. Okay. Okay. Seems like the, um, there's a motion. Seems like there's agreement on the proposal here that. I'll make a motion and then we accept the um, supervisor of attendance as written by um, the administration and move forward to for posting. Second. 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 Why is the roll call? Ms. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Capola? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Sadaway? Yes. Mr. McGee? Yes. Thank you. Next on the agenda is. Um, Request to accept donation from Salem Five Bank, uh, Dr. Tutwiler. Respectfully ask for your support in accepting the donation from Salem Five Bank to Brigham Elementary School. Make a motion to accept. Second. Uh, roll call required. Ms. Cassianos. Yes. Ms. Capola. Yes. Ms. Ford. Yes. Ms. Gailey. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Yes. Mr. Satterwhite. Yes. Mr. McGee. Yes. Next on the list is another request, Dr. Tutwiler. Once again, uh, respectfully ask for your uh, support in accepting uh, a number of donations from Market Basket, Mr. Salamini, uh, and Anthony Ruggiero, who's um, the uncle to Ms. Ruggiero, uh, all things that would go to uh, Fallon Elementary School. Motion to accept. Second. Second. Second requires a roll call. Ms. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Capola? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Sadway? Yes. Ms. McGee? Yes. And there's one final request. I should have recorded this and just hit play. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, respectfully ask for your uh, support in accepting a donation from the Friendly Knights of St. Patrick uh, to the Lynn Public Schools Music Program. 
Better Motion to accept. Second. Second. Second requires a roll call. Ms. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Coppola? Yes. Mr. Floyd? Yes. Ms. Gately? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Sadoy? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Next on the agenda, and I see him here, is um, our CFO, Michael Bertino, who's going to present to the committee. Uh, welcome. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the school committee for having me. I wanted to cover a couple things. I wanted to give you an update on this year's budget as well as uh, talk about the framework for next year's budget. Although over the summer the city and school voted their budgets independently, um, what we do after that is take these numbers and present them to the state in the form of our tax recap. And that's essentially the true vote of the of the budget where they certify that the revenues we're going to receive and the expenditures that we're going to expend are in line and make sense. So um, in late December, our tax rate was certified, which means they agree with our assumptions on the numbers and um, they agree with our expenditures. So um, just about through seven months of the year, I, I'm happy to say that um, the city continues to move in a positive direction. Revenues are trending in the right direction. We see some bright lights in the form of uh, permits and fees, which indicate development amongst the city. And our expenditures are in line. And um, as a CFO, those are the things that you want to see happen, and they're happening. There's also some areas um, where Mother Nature is cooperating this year. It hasn't been as cold in the city buildings and I'm sure in the schools. So. We hope to see some, you know, moderate savings as we go um, into the spring. Next year's budget, um, you know, the city, we're about 60% um, through our draft. Um, we've been meeting with um, various departments, and we've taken the governor's numbers um, for estimates and used them in our budget. So within the next probably two to three weeks, we'll have a firm number on the city side budget. As well, in the next two or three weeks, we will get good estimates for some of the major categories that help move the whole city budget, including the school, which would be our pension appropriation, uh, our maintenance costs, as well as our health care cost. Once we get those, in the next, you know, three to four weeks, we'll be able to give um, the school, um, Kevin and, and Dr. Tutwilder, will be able to give them a rough number so they can start planning their budget. Um, obviously, there's um, the House and the Senate have their versions of the budget going out, but as everybody's aware, we're looking at in excess of um, $30 million in Chapter 70. So I'm sure we could do a lot of good with that money. We'll first have to make sure that we allocate money to approximately $65 million on the city side that's paid for on behalf of the school, but then the remaining will go towards the school so we continue to meet um, our net school spending. Some of the areas in the 2021 budget we're focusing on is obviously our buildings. Um, we're also recommending that everybody take a strong look at technology. Um, there's always different you know, things going out there in the world, in the World Wide Web, so we're trying to upgrade some of our computers to um, make sure that the operating systems we're using are the most current and up-to-date, and we suggest that everybody look at those as well because that's one of the best ways to prevent viruses, having up-to-date technology. Um, and we're also looking at some, on the city side, for some streets and sidewalks. As I mentioned um, to the mayor, I think it's um, where we've turned the corner in last year you know, we did better than the previous year, and this year it's looking better, and next year it's looking a, li a little bit better. It's time that we start creating budget space um, to build a new school. So I've um, taken the liberty to outline and identify some monies that we can start creating budget space this coming year, so 2021, and, you know, hopefully within the next four to five years we could start breaking ground so the way i look at it is over the next four to five years i'm going to create enough budget space so at the end of five years i'll be able to afford um within the 
current budget without asking for any new money within our existing budget will be able to borrow money to build an approximately hundred million dollar school will we'll be able to afford our share of that it takes discipline it, it takes all the departments to work together um, but based on what I see now um, I'm comfortable to say that we'll be able to achieve that goal um, it could be a little bit more I don't think it's going to be less but the idea is each year we set aside a space and every year that space grows and when that space grows after five years that should be enough to make an annual payment based on the city's share of a school um, so those are uh, many of the items we're looking forward to building into the 2021 budget and beyond and um, again right after we get our first rough draft of the budget we'll start working on multi-year projections because I know there's a lot of people that want to kind of get a visual of what I'm talking about and I'll be able to you know further explain that through a visual presentation as well uh, member Nicholson then member Gately <clears throat> Thanks so much for, for coming tonight and for the, the really helpful presentation and for the, the great work that the city is doing to uh, bring that discipline to the budget and, and create that space. I, I much appreciate it on our, on our side. Uh, so the first thing I want to ask about was net school spending. We know that that's based on actuals and so it can be hard to predict. And you also mentioned that some of the actuals are going to be lower than we thought they were going to be. Um, for, for some of the operational costs for things in the school department. W what is that looking like in terms of the effect on net school spending and are, are we tra where we want to be in terms of tracking towards uh, meeting the net school spending targets that we have? Um, we are. Uh, uh, fortunately, um, there's some other night items that are slightly above, but we are still on target to meet it. And we do have, we work closely with Kevin and Dr. Tutwilder to let them know, you know, if this keeps up, it's, it's really been an unusual winter that if we can allocate some money or expedite some maintenance projects, we will do those. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a major part of my job to make sure that the money is spent equally to meet net school spending as well as meeting the needs of the city side. So, um, that's something that I keep a very close hand for. We have uh, reports that we run monthly to make sure we're there. And, you know, sometimes they do trend the, the wrong way, but, um, but right now we're comfortable that we're going to spend slightly more and that we have a contingency, excuse me, a contingency plan if we are on the lower side of that. Mm -hmm. that that's great. That's helpful. Um, in terms of the... The, the the city helpfully produced a document uh, recently about the capital expenditure needs of the city on both the school and the city side. And obviously there's a huge backlog of capital expenditure need, particularly on the school side, and, and a large number of, of school projects that we would like to see to get done. Um, how, how are we thinking about uh, squaring the fact that the process you outlined before and the time it's going to take, it, it would set that... Uh, set us back in terms of meeting the, the, the capital needs that we have for the rest of the, the district in terms of coming at it from the both what we can afford and also what we need. Okay, so I guess something I forgot to mention is um, we do plan on having three um, additional capital um, expenditures for the school during the summer months. Um, we have the boiler, we have a roof and window um, placement. Um, we're looking to each summer to maintain and, and use those summer months to get some of the other capital needs done through the accelerated repair process. So I believe we have, um, this year we're going to finish off one of them um, at the Hood School. That was kind of taken two summers, and we have three more in the pipeline. And it's our goal to use that 12 weeks during the summer to continue to do these expedited projects for buildings that, you know, still have, you know, good use for life and that we can you know, entertain um, these projects. These projects are at a true 80%. Um, so, you know, a million dollar roof cost me $200,000 and I'm happy to do those all day long. Um, that's um, That $200,000 number is, is more what we call cash capital. So that means we'll budget a certain amount of cash capital each year where the city is able to write a check to pay our $200,000 portion and the other 800 will come from the MSBA accelerated repair program 
Um, so I hope that answers your question. I mean, this is obviously we're a little bit behind in, in, in um, you know, the building process. We're hoping that um, the state tweaks their formula in a year or two to um, hopefully help us expedite it. You know, years ago in the early 90s, schools were getting a true 90 percent of what they cost. Um, you know, I'm a little bit wishful thinking that maybe we might see something a little bit closer to that number, but that's wishful thinking, but I'm, I'm pretty positive when it comes to that. But as far as I know now, we're going to keep during the summer months doing the expedited school projects and, you know, we can set our sights on, you know, an approximately $100 million um, building for the school district. And if, I, and if I could just speak to that, if, yeah. if that's okay. Uh, I think. I think there was definitely discussions going on in the legislature. I mean, we, we've, you know, the, the funding piece on the Chapter 70 has, uh, has been approved, but I think the recognition of communities like Lynn, there's a number of them that have these kind of outstanding um, building needs uh, and challenges to try and meet those needs. So there is an ongoing discussion about what else can be done uh, to address, you know, that, that is a piece of, uh, you know, the education, be meeting the education needs of the students in our community and other communities. So I know that there's definitely uh, discussions going on. I have talked to our delegation who is continuing to discuss with uh, the chairs of the Education Committee what other options might be above and beyond what the Chapter 70 investment has happened. So uh, it's a good question. Uh, uh, obviously, we have a substantial challenge. I think the reality is, is we, we need to step in and start the process and then see where we go moving forward. Uh, um, and hopefully we can, we can continue to see progress over the next three or four years. And I think one point, if you could, uh, Mike, make it uh, when you're talking four or five years, but in terms of the process moving forward, if we're actually accepted and we go through the whole process, that the money that the city has to come up with, uh, the, the, the building can already begin before we have to come up with our piece of it. Is that correct? Could you explain that a little yes, bit? Yes, so that's it's correct. Not, it's not five years before the construction begins. So right. Uh, no, it, what I'm saying, it's it's five years before my first, you know, full amortizing payment is made. You know, the, the system that they work on now is pay as you go. So um, if we're building a school starting in, you know, two and a half years and we break ground and we build, you know, 2% of the school each month and I pay for that 2% a month later, the MSBA gives us gives the city their reimbursement portion. So what it, what in effect that does is it really pushes the city payment to full amortization back to really like more like six or seven years. But I'm going to illustrate it over five because you want to build in a little bit of um, budget flexibility and a contingency plan in there. So by them giving us the money the month after we spend it, it'll help us push off our principal and interest payments until the later years of um, the building coming online. Um, that, and al along with that, as another part of the contingency plan, is the city has expiring debt. So if cost, this $100 million estimated project turns out to be 110 or 12, it's not going to be shelved over 10 or 12 million, million because we also have debt that we're paying today and, and next year and the year after that's coming off the books as the useful life of those projects are paid for. So there's multiple avenues that we have to make sure this happens that that's great to hear and I really appreciate that I think it's it's uh, so important that I really appreciate the work you're doing about thinking about how we can tweak the process like you said mayor because I think we we can sit here and understand that the, the the speed at which the process is moving we have grave concerns about whether that's quick enough for us to meet the need that we have in the city and I think we all agree that Massachusetts should be building schools in in Lent, that this is where we need it and, and so you're Everyone's work and being creative about how we do that, I think, is, is really appreciated. So thank you. Member Gately, then Member Ford. So the mayor took my thunder. That's what my question was. Like, we're, we're applying for this um, state of interest for Pickering. Uh, we're putting that in now, and you're talking about four to five years about affording it. So I was a little confused at how, you know, how it was going to be done if we were going to be putting this in now, but the money would be there in five years. And you answered my question. Um, I really, <coughs> I really appreciate the way you've come into our city and the way you have been like a squirrel, you know, stacking up the savings so that eventually in five years we will have all the money that we need so that we can have this done. 
I really appreciate your effort. I think that it's a great job, and, and that's what I tell people out in the community. And I do talk to the people in the community. And one thing was brought up in open mic about having the community involved, and I know that all of us here on the school committee plan on involving the community and talking with them, and I know that throughout our membership, all of us have talked about that. So I just wanted to address the open mic um, for when we go into the building process. But now I know how this is going to be done. I can explain it to my public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Member Ford? Mike, uh, thank you for the, uh, the explanation. I know we've, we're coming a long way, and it's, it's, it's going to be a slow process. And, you know, I know a bond rating is, is better off now. We're, we're improving our financial standing. But I just want to, you know, reinforce my argument all the time is if we have a new school in five years, we need four new schools now. I mean, there really something has to be done at the state level to, to bail us out because we're beyond. We've got 12 schools now that are 100 years old. And, and to say that we're going to have a new one in, in four or five, it'll be probably four years it through an accelerated rate through the uh, MSBA. Uh, by then, we've got like four schools now that are on life support. We, you know, I think it, that something has to be done beyond what we're doing. And I know we're doing all you can at the time. I appreciate it. I know if you don't have the money, it's tough to do anything. But it, we're in a real crisis. I agree, and, and, and you know, like the mayor said, we we're hoping, you know, we can show you know, the governor and the legislature that we're moving forward. But just like in the days that Chelsea needed help and Malden needed help and they came in and they built schools at 90%, you know, if they built schools at 80%, I'd say we can do too. But we really don't know because that 80 is really 65%. So we need some relief from them because it is a monumental task. But, you know, we just need to stay positive. We need to get a win for the city. We need to get a win for the with the children of the city and and everybody who works in those buildings and you know we need to start somewhere so i think it's important um that we come out and we say yes we're starting here and, and we're going to move forward we're going to move fast but we have to understand that there's a process and we have to follow their process and hopefully along the way if they see that we're moving well maybe it'll tweak something for them and they'll say why don't we do this because we're not the only system that has schools that have that age you know there are a number of other communities um so we could all use a little boost and we're just hoping to be positive and and get a boost someday but without that boost we still need to move forward and that's what we want to do no, I, I think isd has done a, a tremendous job over the years basically a lot of these problems you know they keep these schools in, in you know you know good shape but you know it, it bothers me Millions of dollars every year into a hundred-year-old building. That is not not feasible. It, it's you know. <coughs> Understand it. I uh, remember Satterwhite. Thank you. Uh, and I I appreciate the approach of, of not going the 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 route of uh, the tax override like we attempted to before. But I think that everyone at this table and and everyone at home should still understand that this is still taxpayer money that we're using, um, just in a different way. So we still need community buy-in in order for it to uh, to be successful. Um, I know that we had someone speak at Open Mic uh, about that, um, and, and that's that's extremely important. And I'm just gonna jump on what what John said. When you're talking about two hundred thousand for these band-aid or maintenance projects, that's a lot of money, for, for especially for buildings that are substantially uh, aging. Um, so it's it stinks, and and I understand that there's only so much that we can do with what we have. Um, so I'm hopeful that something changes, um, but we, we still need to communicate and, and get, I, I believe, community um, buy-in because maybe something will change in the next couple of years when they see that we're moving forward and maybe the community will, will want a, another building and, and uh, commit to a over, uh, tax override. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's certain things that we, I think that uh, you're not necessarily banking on because you, you're – working with what numbers you have um so I, you know i appreciate that but it's 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 important to understand it's still taxpayer money we, we need to be uh, good stewards of that and it sounds as though it's what you're doing so i appreciate it thank you <clears throat> nicholson guys i just i just wanted to add something i i 
uh, agree with and appreciate everything you said, Mr. Bettino, in response to Mr. Fort. Uh, just wanted to add something to a comment you made about the fact that there are other districts that have the need for new schools. I, I think that's absolutely true. I think it's important for us to recognize ourselves and also to communicate to the to the stakeholders at the state level that there's there's really a select number of districts I think that have had the increase in student population that we have had and have the age of school buildings that we do and th there might be other districts that 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 fit that bill but we we are one of uh, a few that fit that bill and I think make us really compelling candidates for them to, to rethink some of the questions that have, that have been raised. So I just think that's important that we continue to remind people of that. I definitely agree. It, it, it's very unusual when you see the year over year increases, you know, we had to deal with. I mean, um, in speaking with Kevin last week, he, you know, the number of students that came on last year is where I'm where I came from and I grew up and went to school was the equivalent of building a new school to house 450 children so it, when you're looking at that you're right and we are an anomaly when it comes to that um, and we'll hope someone will recognize that and and give us some assistance because we we do need it to expedite it but you know I think you know we have to start somewhere and and coming in here now for a year and a half I think it's it's um, something that you know we need to get a win you know and a win would be one new school you know a double would be two new schools a home run would be four new schools so but we have to start somewhere and that's why you know we thought it was important when we meet with the mayor and everybody else that we at least say okay let's get going and hopefully we'll get some help along the way and just a point follow up I think it's a great point uh, uh, there's just there's a handful of communities in a similar situation as us. So when I'm talking about the discussions going on, you know, Brockton is a, in a similar situation with the exploding population and schools that are that are this this age. So I think the the reality is it's not about all the needs around the Commonwealth. I think it's a focused need of several communities that don't have a lot of space where you can build schools. The schools are aging, the population's exploding, and the communities don't have the the wherewithal to to fund three or four schools. And I think the point's well taken. You know, when Chelsea was in a really tough place. Uh, they they replaced all the schools there at 90 percent, and that you know they were obviously also were at a place financially where they were in receivership, uh, but they were able to do that. So there were a number of communities that were able to make that happen. So I, that's the discussion that's going on. So I think it is it isn't just a broad range of communities that need school. It's a it's a recognition of Lynn and Lynn is one of the handful of communities, and I think it's clearly looking at Lynn as as a challenge. So um, that's that, and again, it's, I think it's going to be all of us. Uh, being pro, continue to be proactive, uh, both in in the community and elsewhere, and, and obviously that for this to be successful, uh, we need uh, clear communication from the beginning and moving forward. And that's I think the goal of everyone around this table, and and we'll we're, we're going to continue focus on that. And how can we clearly make sure that that everybody in the community is part of this discussion? Uh, are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and next on the agenda is a uh, vote to submit a statement of interest for New Pickering Middle School. I'll make a motion, first your vote to be read in for the minutes. Vote to submit statement of interest to the MSBA for Pickering Middle School. Resolved. Having convened in an open meeting on February 13, 2020, prior to the closing date, the Lynn School Committee, City of Lynn, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated on or before April 8, 2020 for the Pickering Middle School located at 70 Camona Avenue 01904, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Mass Building School Building Authority in the future for... Elimination of existing severe overcrowding. Prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollment. Replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems, such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, ventilation system to increase energy conservation expected and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility. Replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide
for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or another funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the District of Lynn to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So that motion's been made. Second. Second. Second requires a roll call. Mr. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Capola? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Satterwhite? Yes. Yes. Next on the agenda is um, a number of other uh, votes requesting um, to be part of the accelerated repair project. Make a motion that a uh, statement of interest resolved. Having convened in an open meeting on February 13, 2020, prior to the closing date, the Lynn School Committee, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated February 14, 2020, for the Lynn Vocational Technical Institute. 80 Neptune Boulevard, 01902, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Replacement of windows and doors to allow for increased building security, reduces heat loss, increase energy conservation, and overall reduce reduce energy consumption as priority statement of interest for the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program for 2020, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts building, School Building Authority, or commits Lynn school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Should they be separate or continue to read them? Separate, Your Honor, can they all be in one? Both. Can be all in one? You can, all in one. Can okay. Resolved. Having convened in an open meeting on February 13, 2020, <clears throat> prior to the closing date, the Lynn School Committee, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated February 14, 2020, for Shoemaker Elementary School, 26 Regina Road, Lynn, Massachusetts, 01904, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Replacement of existing roof with a new EPDM roof with three inches of insulation allowing for reduced heat loss, increased energy conservation, con conservation and overall reduced energy consumption as priority statement of interest for the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program for 2020. And hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits Lynn School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on February 13, 2020, prior to the closing date, the Lynn School Committee, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated February 14, 2020, for Sewell Anderson School, 25 Ontario Street, Lynn, Massachusetts, 01905, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Replacement of existing boilers and associated equipment with new high-efficiency energy-efficient boilers, pumps, devices, 
and controls, allowing for reduced heat loss, increased energy conservation, and overall reduced energy consumption is priority statement of interest for the MSBA Accelerated Repair Program for 2020. And hereby further specif specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits Lynn School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Motion's been made on those th three proposals. Second. 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 Uh, here, seconds. We requires roll calls. A roll call. Mr. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Capola? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Mr. Nicholson? Yes. Mr. Sadoway? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Uh, next on the agenda, um, Camp Rotary proposal. Yeah. If I may, uh, invite Dr. Mr. Tomlano. Thank you. Invite Mr. Cowdell, a, a familiar and friendly face, um, to the table uh, to talk about a wonderful opportunity for uh, 36 uh, deserving young people in Lynn. Thank you, Dr. Tartwiler. Mm -hmm. Thank you, school committee members and colleagues. Good to see all of you again. Uh, back again for this year. This is our sixth season of offering Lynn Kids to Camp. It's the program that we call from Camp Rotary. Uh, so I'm here representing the board of directors for Camp Rotary, youth service managers. And I'm really happy because when I actually was communicating with Dr. Tutwiler, I was telling him that it really, I, I went, kind of switched it off and said, I think what we're going to do instead of offering each elementary school one and middle schools and high schools two, we're going to slide the middle and high school down to the elementary and have all 36 slots go to the elementary schools mm. and uh, basically a pivot in that direction. And then when I went back to the board of directors and explained to them that that's what we had discussed and that that was my suggestion, uh, they actually said we've increased our enrollment spaces this year because of a new dining hall that we're building. And because of that, we're going to realize about 80 more spaces in camp during the summer. And they said, why don't we continue to do both? So they said, we'll continue to, we'll, we'll slide the 36 spots towards the elementary school, but at the same time continue to offer the middle and high school the nice. spots as well. So Great. instead Thank of 36, you. it's going to look more like 48, uh, 48 nice. spots wow. that are coming to, uh, nice. to Lynn Public awesome. School. So I was very happy to hear that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's, it's valid because even though it's sometimes tougher to get the high school kids to, to come on the first time because they're older, they're a little more reticent of, uh, mm -hmm. of starting camp at that age, it's easier, believe it or not, to get the younger kids uh, to, to attend. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also worth the effort, I think, to continue to, to hit that age level because I think there are a lot of kids that need uh, and kind of at risk at that mm -hmm. level as well that we can – uh, sometimes the impact in just one week of one week of camp sometimes can change the whole life of, uh, of a camper. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm here hat in hand again, asking for your permission to uh, to help us to service the Lynn Public Schools kids. Great, thank you. That's great news and uh -huh. um, proposals on the table. Member uh, Gate, um, member Gately. At a time. Is that what your slogan is? Yes, yes. Changing the world one one camper at a time. <laughs> <laughs> My son worked That's there with Rich, and um, great. this is such a great program. It's, it's helps students with um, if they have a little bit of a insecurity or not a good self esteem. It builds it in them, makes them very positive, and. So happy you came back again. We got extra spots. Extra spots. Extra. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. It's great. The uh, the out of school time opportunities for kids is really, mm -hmm. um, so whatever cool. those are, really changes kids' lives. Even for a week, it gives kids a different opportunity to continue to learn in a different way in the summer. This is really exciting. And just having uh, been on and still on both sides of the uh, the educational side, uh, this so much reinforces the social emotional learning that the that the whole curriculum is now sliding towards so um, so it's just great to have that be reinforced during the summer as well awesome, awesome. so is there a motion a motion um, to uh, accept the camp rotary's proposal to fund and, now, and I guess now it's 48 Lynn uh, students to camp rotary for one week of summer camp Lynn kids to camp second second, second. requires a roll call 
Ms. Cassianos? Yes. Ms. Coppola? Yes. Ms. Boyd? Yes. Ms. Gailey? Yes. Ms. Nicholson? Yes. Ms. Saddleway? Yes. Ms. Nia McGee? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, great Thanks part of the all. night was having this happen. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good job, Rich. Keep smiling. Mm. And <laughs> to feel good. Next on the agenda is communication and information. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a an enrollment report um, dated February 1st, and I've got uh, my report to share with you as well. But I'll start first by going a, a quick audible. Um, learned that uh, ISD received a grant in the amount of $25,000 um, that they, speaking of Pickering, um, are intending to earmark for um, replacement of the seats in the, uh, in the auditorium there. So um, ni nice win for a lot of the folks left that were from that uh, neighborhood, but uh, just wanted to give you that, that quick heads up. Also pleased to announce that uh, the English Learner Education Department hosted a very successful parent guardian information night last Tuesday night at, uh, at Harrington Elementary. Uh, a couple of folks uh, on the committee were there. Uh, the exclusive focus of the meeting was the dual language program planned for a fall 2020 opening. Parents were acquainted with the benefits of, the, of dual language programming, the structure of the program from kindergarten to fifth grade, and were presented the opportunity to ask questions if they had them. We also set up a satellite parent information center site uh, where parents could indicate their interest in the program and schedule appointments for the upcoming registration season set to begin in March. Uh, we see the design and implementation of the dual language program as part and parcel of an equity initiative and thus we're really excited about the opening of the program. Attached to this document is a detailed description of the protocol being employed to enroll students in the dual language program. Recall that we will open two sections accommodating up to 50 students, serving virtually equal numbers of native Spanish speakers identified as English learners and students who are not identified as English learners and or non-Spanish speaking English learners. For example, there was one parent who attended who is a native Russian speaker, as is her child, uh, who asked, where does my kid fit in this particular program? That student would be in the second group, the non-English uh, learner, but non-native Spanish speaking. That's good. Of course, I lost my spot. Uh, Oh, thank you. Okay. Enrollment into this program will be determined by a lottery process very much akin to that for pre-K openings to ensure that all those who opt in have an equitable chance of selection. February 5th was the first parent information event on this program, and it was a complete success. A second is in the planning for the spring, and I'll keep you posted uh, through this mechanism um, as that process unrolls. As was communicated in our September meeting, the district has been actively engaged in scripting plans and activities designed to carry out the requisite work described in the strategic initiatives designed to begin this year. To be clear, a small team was trained in how to lead action planning process, the action planning process, under the tutelage of Lori Likas, the architect of the Planning for Success model. These teams began facilitating collaborative planning sessions uh, that began this summer with a broader group of participants. While this continues to be a work in progress, I, want to I wanted to provide a sample of the kinds of outcomes this effort yields. Strategic Initiative 2.2 calls for the Lynn Public Schools to, quote, provide professional development opportunities for all educators focused on trauma-sensitive practice practices, cultural proficiency, culturally and linguistically responsive instruction, an anti-bias curriculum. Engaging a high-level document walk, and there's one attached for you at the back of this document. You can see what follows are, and you might want to look at it because I'm going to walk you through one. Um, it's this document right here. It looks like this. Mm -hmm. Back, back. Back, back. back, back. <coughs> You can see what follows are concrete definitions of the terminology in the initiative as well as the action plan 
specific process benchmarks, due by dates, the person or people responsible, and the status. Further down or on the back, uh, depending on where you are, there's a space to identify evidence of change and then fields designed to identify the resources necessary. I believe that's on the back. A quick review of the process benchmarks would leave the casual observer to an understanding that there is a lot of work to make each strategic initiative come to life. <clears throat> we are mindful of that and being realistic about what can be accomplished in the time period identified. I say this not to suggest that there are things that won't be addressed, but more to underscore the flexibility <laughs> feature and the living nature of these documents. The process benchmarks reflect deep thinking of what needs to be done. Simply put, each needs to be completed thoroughly and completely in order for the initiative to push us closer to meeting the objective. We have designed a process to help us stay on top of the work that's being done, but also adjust where necessary. Each month, all of the trained facilitators in the action planning process, along with my team, meet to take stock of where we are with each action plan and where more emphasis or flexibility is required. We see this as an effective way to progress monitor. At the first school committee meeting for the month of April, I'm planning to provide a formal update on the progress toward meeting the district improvement goals. At the same point, I'll provide another update on action plans and the progress therein. The narrative around the Student Opportunity Act continues to unfold. On February 7th, we were provided additional guidance on the expectations around funds allocation and specifics on the three-year plan we must create and submit by April 1st. While there's no requirement, I would like to present this three-year plan at our March 26th, 2020 meeting for your approval. To the degree that we're all on the same page and moving in the same direction with respect to allocation of the funds, transparency and success will be more probable. I just want to mention just quickly, um, you heard from Mr. Bertino about when he planned to let us know what our number is. We really can't start putting things together until we have that. So you might say, geez, March 26th, your plan is due four days later. That's not a lot of time for us to kind of sit and think about this, but um, these are the, the timelines that we have to work within, uh, and, it, 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 and it's going to happen quickly, but you will get um, the proposal, um, that three-year plan that we have to submit to DESE a week before the meeting, so you will have some time to, to sit with it. Uh, by way of brief editorial, the student learning and district improvement goals for school years 1819 and 1920 and the strategic objectives outlined in our strategic plan are seamlessly aligned with the expectations around funds allocation in the Student Opportunity Act. I see this as an affirmation of the path we have chosen in the Lynn Public Schools. Further, the alignment will make completion of the three-year uh, th three plan less burdensome. Related, in the January 30th superintendent's report, I offered a detailed insight to how we are collecting feedback from parents, teachers, and the broader community. Student voice is critical to this endeavor. Last year, I proposed the development of a citywide student advisory, a small representative group of students who would serve as a sounding board for things we're thinking about, but also a mechanism through which to gather student input. I'm in the process of putting the group together, which could not be timelier given the Student Opportunity Re Act requirement for input. Once created, I will report out on the makeup of the group, and you can expect specific information relative to the input they provided in the coming weeks. The first meeting is set for March 3rd, 2020. And I'll also say that um, Ms. O'Neill from the Lynn Teachers Union has been actively in support of this initiative, gathering feedback from teachers, and also has a stack of almost 300 essays from middle school students on how the money will be spent. <laughs> wow. Yes. Bye bye vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so now the pressure's on me to read. But it's actually it's actually my pleasure. Um, 
By way of reminder, as part of the bill signed in November 2018, there's an effort to begin, effort to heighten civics knowledge and awareness in the eighth grade. Toward that end, Shannon Gardner recently applied for and received a $45,000 grant, which was the maximum allowable grant for Lynn from the uh, State Civics Project Trust Fund. These funds pay for training of our eighth grade teachers by Generation Citizen, an awesome organization. At present, all eighth grade civics teachers have been trained. It is also our intention to provide Generation Citizen training for some high school teachers this year so that civics education can be supported in the upper grades. All trained teachers will be working with their eighth grade classes on actions, action civics projects in the spring. In addition to the training, Generation Citizen provides teachers with a binder of lesson ideas, and they provide in-person support to any teacher who reaches out for assistance. They also provide materials for students to complete their projects. One thing we would truly appreciate is help spreading the word to city departments, Lynn political leaders, and our state delegations that students will be calling and emailing with inquiries. It would be wonderful if they could understand the positive impact that just a quick reply could have. Teachers and students do know that part of civics education is finding out how things work and why, and that it may not always be possible to bring, out, bring about change, although it's certainly rewarding when they can. They also know that part of civic education is finding the right people to call who can assist with their questions. Any response to further their education or kindly redirect them when they're off track to a solution will contribute to their civic education. We also appreciate leaders who want to make arrangements with teachers to visit the students in regard to their questions. Some did this last year, and the students and teachers very much appreciate it. More to come on that. That is all I have. Thank you. Um, before we, uh, <coughs> I just have one comment. Oh, Member Castellano. Yeah, so I just, um, I want to first of all, I want to thank Patrick for all the work, uh, Deputy Superintendent, everyone. I, I just, a few years ago when we first interviewed you for this position of superintendent, I found to hear the reports and the communication, the level of what's coming to fruition and the efforts being put forth, it's just, it's, it's inspiring. Um, it's something that I, I really, I can't put into words how grateful I am. It's a, it's a really, it's a true honor for me as a school committee member to be part of this process. Um, to hear the focus of student voice, I remember traveling with the teachers union to a training in New York and hearing just how critical it is to, to have student voice and to see that still, that parallel still being um, worked on is just, it's, it's, it's authentic. Yeah. It's, it's holding accountable, you guys accountable for what we're, not only we're talking about it, we're putting it to action. Um, and to, to see the, the, the Civics uh, Project Trust Fund grant and to see that um, organization, Generation Citizen, I think about Carlos Perdaccio, who, um, who brought this to a lot of our doorsteps um, in a packet with a letter. Um, to see that it was very much followed up with, it's just so much so much positivity to that. Um, it's really, I can't even, I'm just so motivated and I'm just really, I'm just happy to be part of this. And it's really emotional for me because I work with these children in these schools every day. I see some of the most difficult sides of what I, of, of social work, of, of, of the school system. And to really see the success uh, and the efforts um, being made, it's, it's, it's amazing, especially I see tra the trauma-sensitive practices and the, just the initiatives are just such, if, if people are out there, I just want, we have a serious team. Like this team, this, the folks up here are taking this very serious. I have a lot of constituents that I, I work with on the daily that um, also can attend to that. And okay. I think that's, I want to shed light to that. Because, okay. you know, it's, it's, sometimes we, we're working on a really gloomy environment, but let's, we could shed some light, and I think we're we're really uh, we're, we're the number one contender. So thank you, I thank appreciate you. that. Saying that. You. And and a follow up to that, I think you know we go to a, we come to meetings, and I think tonight's meeting was pretty uplifting. We had an amazing group of students early on, 
we're able to move forward on hopefully addressing some of our school needs and then to hear the um, 48 students that are going to be in a camp rotary as well as the, the report and the good things going on and follow up I think with what Member Castellanos is saying. It's a uh, uh, good night here on the committee. So thank you all for the work you're doing and uh, um, you know the, we're continuing to work together and making a difference. So thank you all. Yeah. Make a motion. Member Coppola. Oh. Um, just one last thing. I know we recognize the friendly niceness of Patrick who gave um, a donation to the Lynn Public School Music, and we re and we took a moment of silence for Frank Pagnotta, who passed away, who for many, many years really made a wonderful music um, program for the Lynn Public Schools. And talking about kids going, the band went there to his wake and uh, did many songs at his wake. And um, it was at Salamini's, and Dave Salamini made envelopes that people could take and also donate. So if there's anybody out there who would still like to, in Frank's memory, donate to the Lynn Public School Band, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Make you. a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have yeah. it. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs> I told Jared I got to work my way up to the better plan. <laughs> <laughs>